Welcome back, Flickers, to Far Out Flicks. I am your host, Andrew, and joining me... I am Brayden. Yeah, he's Brayden. You know that, though. You've I'm been s- here I'm before. I'm still here. I'm s- I haven't been replaced yet. We're, we're like a nice audible pub that you sit down and you know all your friends there and all two some, of us some drunk asleep by the dartboard sometimes that's andrew <laughs> i would <laughs> never sleep under a dartboard even in my drunkest state i'm too too smart too spry for that not uh, to not to reveal too much but andrew and i used to work at a bar and there was a guy who worked also worked at the bar named steve and Steve was an insane alcoholic, but multiple times we went in to open and he yeah, was not passed the fun, out. like sexy kind of alcoholic, like, you know, happy hour with the coworkers. No, like some trailer park shit alcoholic. Uh, We're but... like, we'd go in and he'd be passed out under the pool table, surrounded by empties with shit in his pants. Dude, not just empties. The the incident you're referring to was Sparks empties. And for <laughs> any any of our listeners who might not have been able to drink or like even in the appropriate age range to be drinking when Sparks were a thing, which they're very much illegal now. Um, or well, they might exist in some like neutered version, like, like Four, four Loco. Locos do. But it was it was the original Four Loco, the original alcoholic beverage loaded to the gills. With like every kind of non-regulated stimulant they could put into it. And this dude, and like these are one, like 16 ounce cans. And it's like easily 5% ABV. So we're talking like 16 ounce Bud Heavies with the added effect that it's got over the counter crack in it. And this guy had like, oh, what was it, like six or seven of them? And this was like, a, I mean, the bar had shut down and he came back. Like, he used his manager key to get in and then proceeded to drink, like, a, a six-pack of fucking Sparks, 16-ounce Sparks, and then slumber under the pool table. And his pants had been removed and they had shit in them. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. That's, that's the best part. That's, that's what really sells the story. I think the Sparks is the part that I enjoy because I'm just like... If I drink six sparks right now, like the outcome of my evening is like life or death. It's a coin toss. I don't know. I think six sparks might kill me. Uh, and I'm of reasonably good health. It is not something a healthy person would ever do to themselves. Never in a million years. I just remember asking my manager at that time for a pay raise up to 850 and he just laughed in my face. Dude, I did the same thing, but it was to uh, the owner who will go nameless. Um, we'll just call him E, Easy E. Uh, I asked Easy E to be raised up to 850 after you quit, which was not long after this, because uh, I thought I had a little leverage at that point. Like there weren't that many like competent or sober people that worked there. Uh, and the owner's exact words were, "Nobody around here is making eight fucking fifty an hour." Was <laughs> That's what that's, he told me, hilarious. which was a lie. I, like, obviously, there were a few people that were like his favorites that he would pay, and I should I have been his know, favorite. Dude. I did everything for that fucking tyrant. I, I literally would do his like prep work when he worked in the kitchen before he got back there, just so he would like look around and have nothing to do, and he just like go get drunk at the bar instead. Which is do I finally he... get to have our Murphy's Irish Pub bitch fest? Is this the episode he threw? It's... This guy threw a five-gallon bucket of ranch at a server. <laughs> Dude, he, like, threw a hamburger at me lacrosse style with a spatula at one point. <laughs> they got to the point where you just, like, and I think you and I both mastered it, but, like, when you deal with somebody, like, that toxic and terrible, you just have to be, like, even in the face of, like, the absurd evil that is pouring out of their soul, you just have to just be, like, overwhelmingly positive and unfazed and that like that's what really is like knives in their heart they can't take it that's they can't true. take that they're like not ruining your fucking existence with them i mean i always i always had a sense of humor about it i was like i'm living in a fucking comic strip right now Dude, it really was the most <laughs> absurd period of my life i mean <laughs> the, the things i witnessed in that, that <laughs> hellhole of a bar good times good times good times that, we're not here to have old bar stories. Who would listen to that? We're here to talk um, about movies. And movies. I will say, in preparation for this week's movies. film, I also watched The Witch over the weekend, okay. which was a lot of fun. I, hadn't I haven't watched The Witch since it came out. Um, I hadn't either, and it was 
Well, interestingly enough, Robert Eggers doesn't even like that movie. He says that it wasn't like, what you know, complaining McComplainerson because he doesn't. Yeah. He complained <laughs> that in the Northmen, like studio executives, like adulterated his vision. But then he said in The Witch, he wasn't able to get his vision out of his head onto film, which I guess leaves only the lighthouse that he loves. So he is content with the lighthouse, though. He didn't complain about it in the he interview. Hasn't, he hasn't been vocally critical of his work. I mean, who doesn't love the lighthouse? It's awesome. All I'm saying is the witch like has an ab- absurd following of people that love it. It was universally critically praised. And it grossed ten times its budget in the box office. Uh, so, like, yes. by... By pretty much like every possible metric, The Witch was a massive success. For a $4 and... million dollar movie, it did extremely well. It launched the career of Anya Taylor-Joy, basically, as far as I'm Who, concerned. Yes, as Thomason in that, but she will be a main character in this film as well. She's my favorite hot alien looking person. Agreed. Um, I love those eyes that are just those, a little bit too far apart. Eyes. It's exotic. Indeed. I, I actually, I, I watched Last Night in Soho with her uh, in it as well, the most recent Edgar Wright film, and I thought that was quite good. Um, I, I do have a soft spot in my heart for Edgar Wright and pretty much everything he does, uh, but I thought Last Night in Soho was excellent. Um, Very good. Did you I, see... I mean, it, it's nice to see him like perform and perform well without like Simon Pegg possibly doing a lot of the lifting. There you go. Did you happen to see the chess show that she was on? That was also pretty good. Uh, no, because I'm not going to watch a show where a heroin addict gets better at chess when they do heroin. And I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry, but like anybody who fucking buys that is just deluding themselves about the reality of heroin, which is like... In- I don't know if that was the message. All right. I don't know if I agree that was the message of the show. I think she just happened to be on tranquilizers, but she was just... A chess prodigy who happened to be on tranquilizers. All I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know if the messaging there was that it was making her better. And maybe I should, maybe I should watch it. But and I, I do love uh, as a chess fan and an Anya Taylor Joy fan. Why not? It's, All right, I'll give it a fine. chance. But if there is like any hint that like somehow <laughs> tranquilizers are making this person better at chess, I'm turning it off and I'm giving it a thumbs down on Netflix. Anyways, that's hurtful. That hurts her great. As you all know, because you clicked on this podcast, you read God the title. Damn it. As, Not as again, brain likes to re- remind me before I do my like. Did you guess the movie we're doing bit? Which is the second week in a row I've done that bit. But, <laughs> it's like uh, the tenth. It's like the tenth. Whatever. Some they version all, of it. They all run together. Uh, <laughs> we're doing the Northman this week. Uh, we've mentioned doing it in recent episodes. I'm super fucking pumped about doing it. Uh, I love this movie. This movie brought a sense of joy to me that I had not... I mean, like, obviously I love horror. I love the shock. But, like, this film was, like... The only way I can describe it is how I felt the first time I saw Gladiator before it was played one million times on cable primetime television. And I got really sick of it, but... Share some similarities with that. I mean, it's kind of, like, pure, unadulterated, just testosterone-fueled violence it's pretty well, awesome. it's a story it's a story of revenge our main character is just like this unstoppably badass physical warrior uh he is enslaved um and you know basically like exacts his vengeance from the standpoint of a slave so i think there and it's also i mean that obviously ridley scott for gladiator love ridley scott you know he's a far out flicks fave um but I, I think that there's like a lot of similarities between the two. I, I remember thinking at the time Gladiator was very visually stunning. Um, you know, in retrograde, it was well shot. It's a beautiful film, and there's a reason why I enjoyed the absurd success it did and catapulted Russell Crowe's career. Um, and but, Joaquin Phoenix. And Joaquin Phoenix, you're right. God, he's such a good villain um, in that film. But... Uh, like in retrograde, like it's it's a beautiful film. It's very well shot, and I will always love it. But it's like, I don't think it's as visually stunning as The Northman. 
But I also, I'm just partial to like Scandinavian shit. So we got that going. Fair enough. So I guess without question, you prefer the Northmen to Gladiator if put in that situation. Yeah, I think like a more fair question is like, did like 11 year old me, did, did the amount of love that 11 year old me had for the Gladiator equal or surpass or, you know, fall short of the 33 year old me's love for the Northmen and I think it's a fucking damn close battle but I think it goes to the Northmen at the end of the day it's just because like I got you know some some Norse ancestry I, I don't have a whole lot of Roman roots per se um the Northmen's extremely badass also badass. I, I mean it does share some similarities with um the gladiator but also he said that one of his primary inspirations besides all the Scandinavian mythology that it clearly draws from was conan the barbarian which i could uh, see that and conan man conan's badass dude i'd like to do an episode on conan like oh i mean is that gonna be a bonus content it's gonna be a long fucking episode man i keep seeing conan the barbarian on like hbo or something and i get all excited and then i realize that it's a remake with the aquaman guy and every time my excitement is just followed by what's, what's the, the big quote from conan the fun one is to you know what is best in life to crush your enemies to see them driven before you and to hear the lament lamentations of their women nice yeah um so what what else has roger ebert done though let's um roger so we, robert oh, eggers eggers did yeah. you call him roger what else ebert? Is Ro roger eggers <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> what else has Roger Eggers done? So we, we mentioned, and I, you know, his uh, roster list is not super long. Um, you know, he's a young man, granted, uh, or like relatively young in the world. He's of pretty like, young. He's pretty young. Um, well, I think one of, he did some short films early on, one of which was The Telltale Heart, which is on YouTube. And I watched which was pretty fun. He also did... Then his first feature film was The Witch, followed by The Lighthouse. The Northman's his third one. He's been trying to make a Nosferatu remake for quite a while, which there's some speculation that by, might be his next film, which I think that would be incredibly badass. Have you seen the original Nosferatu? I have. Pretty, dude, pretty creepy. Uh, Extremely for, creepy. I think yeah, that's one of the... the time. One of the creepiest villains of all time. I mean, and visual... Anya Taylor Joy is uh, slotted to be in that too, right? I don't know that he's actually said that that's what he's working on now, or I don't know if that's been revealed yet or even teased. But he's been trying to get that made since before the Northmen. He's been working on that one for a while. All right, very cool. Very into that. Very far out. Um, the lighthouse we mentioned that earlier is the only one he hasn't personally panned. No, in some way. to be clear, he said he he did not personally pan the Northman. I think he wants to wait and see how much money it's going to make can make before he. But he did say there was studio interference. But he also said he still likes it, and he said that they helped him make it the most entertaining that a Robert Eggers movie can be. I mean, yeah. He mentioned think, that's not his goal. They, like, streamlined it, made it more watchable, basically. Yeah, I mean, studios are usually good for that. You know, sometimes they miss the mark. but They, they don't want a three-hour art film. Well, that's like, I mean, you know, they learned from Joe Dorowski, right? Like, the studio's role is to, like, you know, rein the artist in and, like, somehow make it not only palatable to a wide enough audience, but, like, something that will get a wide enough audience to come pay 14 dollars sure. a ticket plus, a commercial you know, product 20 bucks for drinking a popcorn the, end of the, day, um, it's the it, film industry emphasis on industry but this is a beautiful a beautiful uh finished product in my opinion and you know again also i just want to say like sometimes the studio misses the mark and they miss it bad uh Often. i don't think this is one of them they pro i mean with it with it being an eggers film they probably put some fucking talent on it you know, and also the cast, right? Like, this isn't a, a cheap cast, necessarily. Um, no. Running through some of the cast members. Uh, Nicole Kidman, who I love. Man, always bewitched. Uh, Anya Taylor-Joy, who we mentioned. Ethan Hawke is in it. Willem Dafoe. 
Bjork is in it. Um, and then, of course, playing the hero of our tale, Alexander Skarsgård of the Skarsgård acting family. Uh, but the Skarsgårds, you know, we've got uh, Bill Skarsgård. Yeah, he's That's... got like two brothers and his father's an actor. It's acting a whole family dynasty. of Skarsgård actors and they're all good looking, exceptionally tall uh, Swedish men. Um, Bill Skarsgård, he was, um, he played It in the remake, right? Yeah, Pennywise. I, I think yeah. that's the only one I'm, one I know of him. Um, he was in a show called I think Wayward Pines. Um, okay, that sounds like a Twin Peaks like tribute. It was like, I mean, it was a little bit more marketed to like probably like the young adult teen. I mean, I don't know. It was actually pretty heavy. There's some pretty intense violence in it now that I think about it. But it was like a weird like kind of like werewolf vampire in the same town mashup but they did it well and it was still pretty inventive i'm gonna give wayward pines a thumbs up um fair it was canceled after i think three seasons but it's pretty fun pretty cool and he's like a really creepy like socialite vampire in that film uh but bill skarsgård dude he's that motherfucker is tall like quite tall uh I want to say he's like 6'6 six, six or 6'7. Six, Alexander Skarsgård, I believe he's in Succession, which I fucking love Succession. Have you watched that show yet? Oh, he's only 6'4. Uh, but so is Alexander. No, I have not. Actually, Dude, so yeah. All that's the like Skarsgårds one of the best things are on fucking TV. like 6'4. All of them. Um, yeah, they're giant. Which, who's in that, man? That's like an HBO people. show, right? Yes. It, um, the, I mean, the main character, the main famous guy is Brian Cox, who was like, the head of this dynastic family just watch Mm. that it's so good speaking of dynasties the scars guards acting dynasty yep um his father though uh the most well known of the scars guards uh stellan who is just like the best villain uh also he's a little a little far out flicks connection um he is in dune he's in he's baron harkonnen He's in, yes, fantastic as Baron Harkonnen. He's also in The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. Oh, fuck yeah, he is. He's the uh, the, the, the money, right? He's in a, a, quite a few far out flicks. He's also in a mm. bunch of, um, you know, big mainstream Disney things like Pirates of the Caribbean and Thor and Avengers. Their whole family is just so attractive. Good genes, good genes. Anyways, uh... <laughs> Yeah, Bill Skarsgård has been in a bunch of stuff. He he plays a villain pretty often. Um, Hunt for Red October, Goodwill Hunting. Oh, fuck yeah, um, he's he's been, dude. He's very credited. But anyways, back to like the billing here. Like that's not a bunch of cheap actors, right? You know? No. And The Witch, the first film, cost four million. The Lighthouse, I want to say, cost nine million. This one cost estimated between seventy and ninety million. So that's a big jump from nine million of his last feature film. It also box office just shy of seventy at sixty nine million. Um, so this one lost which, money. I mean, it lost money in the box office. Essentially, plot of the film is based off of an original legend of Amleth, which are you familiar with this, Andrew? Uh, only loosely um my norse mythology slash danish norse history is um mediocre at best but i'm not like totally unfamiliar um i'm lacking in that area as well i mean i guess it's attributed to this guy saxo grammaticus who apparently lived sometime in like the 1100s the 12th century and who was mm -hmm. a danish danish historian Interestingly enough, most people are today are familiar with it because Hamlet is based off of that, which I'm not a big Shakespeare guy either. I appreciate it. I'd I'd love to just be an old man who's bored and like deep dives into that, but that'd be a whole I mean, other some, podcast. You could read some Shakespeare like in an afternoon. Like you could read Taming in the Shrew pretty quickly. I mean, I could, but if you want to like get into it, get into that meaning. Like you almost have to be like a scholar of it to fully appreciate it. I feel Richard maybe, the third's short too. It's not fun. You know, maybe it's, I'd get like 60% of it, but that 
all I feel like Richard the III and... has child death in it. So you know, oh, I'm gonna nice. give a nod to Shakespeare being one of the first to do well. Very good. I mean, actually, child death always existed. We like stopped being okay with it, but child death in Richard the Third, he uh, he kills his two nephews. I want to say to make sure that they don't have a, a claim to the throne. Anyways, Heck yeah, that's basically Game of Thrones stuff. Well, that's actually know? Richard the Third is based on Richard the Third, although. They say that like some some of the attributes they portrayed him as aren't a hundred percent historically accurate. Like he's like deformed in the play. I think he might have been like a little deformed. Like you know the royals end up being sometimes. Um, but but was he like truly like an usurper who like slaughtered family members? If he was, they all kind of did it. That's a lot I'm of saying. them were. Yeah, exactly. So we got Hamlet's based off this legend of Hamlet. Got a bunch of other movies. Uh, there was one in the 90s called Prince of Jutland, which I have not seen, but Christian Bale stars as I think it's Jutland, but yeah. Prince of Jutland. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds yeah. better. Mm-hmm. Also, most familiar with probably my generation, The Lion King. <laughs> which which is, you know, a an omelet-looking uh, tribute, basically. Um Right, and it I mean, it matches up kind of like beat for beat with a lot of what's in the Northmen, except much less violent and messed up. Sure, and he's not like nearly as big of a melancholy little punk ass bitch tab uh, as Hamlet is. Hamlet's all mopey. Any, anyways, I love Hamlet. Um, I love Shakespeare. <laughs> I'll go ahead and say it. I'm a Shakespeare nerd. Um, I wish I was. I, I like I I hope to have the time to get in there because i mean the reason it's in so enduring is because it's so freaking good right and like illuminating of human nature yeah and i mean like this it's an epic right like it's got all the the call signs of like an epic tale and i love a good epic tale like gilgamesh is my shit um the odyssey and the freaking iliad are sweet as well i almost said odyssey and oracle which is a zombies album uh odyssey love and iliad. zombies yeah love that album sweet. i do too uh, man care of cell 44 is that what's called? dude i love that song that's a song i want to be buried to slash catapulted um but nice you know what that's all about uh so the the film though this it revolves around prince amleth um who is on a path of revenge uh which we'll get to in a second but his father arvindil um king arvindil is you know, that, that name might, like, kind of sound familiar to certain listeners, certain scholastic Tolkien-friendly listeners. Uh, for Arendel, who is a character, a half-elf in the Silmarillion, um, Arendel and Arvindel are cognates uh, between Old English and, you know, like, Old Norse, essentially. Um, Arvindel also is ascribed to, or, like you know, described as the morning star, um, which if you are biblical or even have some familiarity with like biblical writings, uh, you know, whether that be the Torah or the old Testament or, you know, whatever else it, it pick, pick your favorite monotheistic religion that came from the deserts. Uh, Lucifer is also called the morning star. So there is like some intertwining, like where, Arvindel has been translated as Lucifer in certain works, um, which is just an interesting little thing I wanted to bring up. Every Same. cell in my body just wants to give you a wedgie right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can try. The second you mentioned Sumerillion, I was out, dude. <laughs> yeah, the Sumerillion, if, for those who are not familiar, the Sumerillion is like Tolkien's equivalent of the Bible for Middle Earth, right? Like, it's like the creation story. And it is extremely difficult to read. I fucking love Tolkien, and I, like, really had to struggle to get through the Silmarillion. I did not retain a lot of it. Um, it felt like I was reading the Old Testament. Was, but, like, but somehow you can... more confusing, because, you know, it's... It, anywhere. Anyways, now you're, now anyways. you're part of a special club of people who have read that. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people have at like least tried to read it again. Like I'm not claiming to have retained all of it or remember any, <laughs> any good bit of it, but cause it is like of all of his works, it's the toughest to get through. Um, 
It doesn't help that he just like made up all those fucking languages. You know what I mean? It, yeah, anyways. that's that's he's on another level with making up of the languages. Dude, he he was a literary and like phonetic genius. I that's guess. that's Asperger's. <laughs> he, he might have he might have been. Uh, I did, I he's also a friend of no. C.S. Lewis. Fun fact. That is fun. Actually, I'm gonna do. I'll be done with Tolkien after this. I swear to God. But uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, so C.S. Lewis, um, you know, a lot of, if you are familiar with him, he wrote The Lion, uh, The Witch in the Wardrobe, the entire Chronicles of Narnia series. He also wrote a book called Mere Christianity that, like, every Bible study in America touches at some point. And it's actually a very good, very good book. Um, but he and Tolkien were good friends, and, like, in one correspondence between the two of them, Tolkien had, like, sent him a letter saying, he's like, oh, I've got this great new character I've come up with. Like, I can't wait to tell you about it. And C.S. Lewis responded back. And, like, at one point in the letter, he's like, just don't let it be another fucking dwarf. Which I think is just <laughs> hilarious. Uh, That's but pretty anyways, funny. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done funny. with my, like... A little I'm nerd humor nerding. for you. Yeah, we're just going to nerd out on this I don't think an elf right is that much better than a dwarf. I'm just going to throw that out there. Well, I mean, it's like, one same. is tall and beautiful and lives for forever and, like, you know, is regarded as just, like, the perfect life form in Middle Earth. And then the other, you know, digs mines in ill-advised locations and gets slaughtered by hordes of fucking goblins. Now, that is racist in the truest form of the word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a elfist, I guess. Um <laughs> Elf supremacist. No, whatever, dude. All I'm saying is the <laughs> the dwarves are always fucking up one way or another. In the fair, Hobbit, they just fair. they they pile up a bunch of gold and they invoke the fucking you know in, invoke smog. Smog comes upon them for their gold and fucking dicks them up. And then you know in in Lord of the Rings, the mines of Moria, dude. They fucking they went somewhere they shouldn't have been. Reel it back only, in. If they had really... only consulted with the elves, Reel the elves it would back have told in. them not to mine there. Reel it back in. Didn't mean All to, I'm saying. Didn't mean to set you off, buddy. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Reel it back in. But yeah, so I guess Robert Eggers, I think this was before he was even making The Lighthouse. He went on a trip to Iceland with his wife. And during this trip, he met Bjork. So Bjork kind of plays a big role in the making of this in a way because she introduced Eggers to Shion, who I guess Shion is an Icelandic poet, novelist, screenwriter, artist. Yeah, co-writer of this. Co-writer of this, exactly. And he yeah. also collaborates a lot with Bjork. He's even performed with her and her band. They're both from... Bjork uh, is in this movie. I don't yes. know if I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, she, I don't know if you mentioned it either, but but yeah, so Bjork and Sean are both from Reykjavik, Iceland. And like that's kind of where that's kind of what got some of these creative juices flowing. Then at a certain point, Robert Eggers met with Alexander Skarsgard to kind of discuss working together in the future. And Skarsgard told him he'd been trying to make a Viking movie for forever. Um and essentially, he kind of, this was Skarsgård's brainchild, really. Skarsgård was like, make, let's make a Viking movie. Badass. This got Eggers all excited. Then later, he kind of talked to Shion, and they ended up writing the movie together. Uh, Robert Eggers, his father was actually a professor of Shakespeare, and his mother was like an actress and kind of did like a children's theater company. It's the perfect storm in a way. But yeah, so they ended up writing this movie. They got on all these historical consultants. Like one was this archaeologist named Neil Price. Another one was literary scholar Johanna Katrine Fredrik's daughter. You did good there. Thank you. Thank you. I tried. And yeah. yeah, I mean, he said basically his goal was to make this as historically authentic as possible in every way. Which I just love, man. I mean, like, obviously, I, I appreciate all things kind of like Viking mythos as a, as a part Viking myself. Uh, but I, I appreciate, like, that this didn't, this portrayed them, like, as what they were, which, you know, at the time was like, somewhat still very primitive people right like you know 
this wasn't your typical fucking King Arthur and the round table, you know, bullshit. There, there's obviously some, like, developed society, but, like, they're still doing some fucking crazy tribal shit, and that's Dude, fucking sweet. They're still doing some, like, b- barbarian shit, basically. I mean, they have, like, berserker raids and stuff. It's f- badass. Which is real. It's a real thing. We watch them have a fucking sweet mushroom party where they, like, chant like they're in a drinking club or whatever, you know? Is that the Amleth's around. initiation ritual you're talking about? Because there was one part where he was saying, like, there were a few historic references for, like, some of these rituals, and he kind of... But there is historical evidence that they were taking this drug called Hensbane that was, like, basically making them hallucinate and do some crazy stuff, and there were witches and... Well, so, like, berserkers, for people who are unfamiliar with that term, were, like, a, a like class of uh, a Viking warrior who were, like, very shamanistic. They, you know, they partook in uh, ingesting substances that brought them closer to the spirit realm. But what, what they were really known for was uh, their, like, intense, like, fury, rage, and, like, you know, unbelievable fighting skills. But also the fact that they seemingly did not feel pain like a normal man would probably in part because of the hen's bane but they would be they would get in these like you know not fugue states but these like trance war states where they would get all hopped up on the drugs and fucking chant with each other and then they would just like go raid a village and slaughter which is like pretty fucking metal honestly it's like as metal as it gets um and i don't know it kind of speaks to me i remember in high school my friend was trying to order viking berserker mushrooms off the internet and i was like i just don't know if this is a good idea dude yeah but it's also a great idea (laughs) it might have been it might have you might dude you might have fucking seen the tree of kings and your whole path would have been laid out for you (laughs) so yeah like this whole movie was filmed on location not in iceland but it was actually filmed in northern ireland ireland and Filmed over 87 days. They built those villages for this, which is kind of cool. Like, that just adds to the authenticity. Um, everything was real, right down to, like, the fish hanging from the clotheslines and stuff. One kind of mark of his work, again, he tries to make every film as authentic as possible, but he also used a single camera for the whole film, which is kind of nuts if you think about it. It is absolutely insane. (laughs) It's insane for like a production this big, not to like film scenes with multi multi cameras. Pretty wild. They built an entire like wooden ship for this. They did use CGI and like some things were like done in post production using CGI. Wait, which ship did they build? Um, is it the one? It's the exact replica of the Otter Kinner. Uh. I'm not sure. I think it's the one where at near the end when he like jumps off the boat and goes under the water. But, but yeah, I didn't know if it was that one or when he's being when they're all rowing. As a slave. I think I both think of would, those were think, real ships, dude. I think you would call that a carve. Those were all real. All those boats. I don't know if it was the same boat or not. Mm, I wonder if it was for both of them. We would probably not catch that, right? And then Robert Eggers. When the, so it was like a really hard shoot. Everyone was like kind of totally worn out and tired by the end. He gave really cool gifts to all the members of the cast. I guess the high profile ones. He gave that Viking longship to Willem Dafoe. Oh man, which is and kind Willem of Dafoe just a, is perfect in this. That's kind of like a nutty thing. And then he gave Alexander Skarsgård his bloody bloody thong from the end of the movie. That's uh, I mean. <laughs> I would rather have had a wooden ship, but you know, that's just me. <laughs> then he uh, gave swords to like Nicole Kidman, Anya Taylor Joy. He gave horses to Bjork. My, minor correction: um, I, I said carve. Carve is actually a long ship. So like the ships we see at the start of the film when the king is returning, that's a carve. Uh, the little ones that they're on, both in the being transported as a slave and then leaving. Uh, Iceland. That is not a car. That is something else. That Interesting. I don't know. Well, it was the full sized Viking longship that he gave to Willem Dafoe. So I'm guessing that's, so that's the huge that is one. a carve. Okay. Yeah. I love just 
the commitment to the authenticity. I mean, he kind of begrudgingly used CGI. He in an interview, he like talked about like, hey, using a little CGI is not a sin, man. And it's like no one said it was a sin. Like you're getting a little too defensive about this. He probably felt dirty all over. I think he did. I think that he's kind of like, you know, that's not his thing at all. Yeah, to go from the lighthouse where it's like basically nothing but practical effects and like effectively just a, a long display of uh, somebody's ability to write two character dialogue for an hour and 40 minutes or whatever. Uh, right. To like, to doing, you know, effectively, which like by all means should be a blockbuster. Uh, I bet he felt a little dirty. Doing to be it. clear, the CGI was minimal. I, minimal, I, I read an interview minimal. with him where he defended how minimal it was. For like 30 minutes. <laughs> I bet he did. Did he like... He, he went into extreme detail of how they used all practical effects and then at some little things they had to do with CGI at the end, but it was real Viking longship, blah, blah, blah. He, he left that interview and went back to the fucking green room and just like started pounding fucking whiskey, just enraged. <laughs> <laughs> An immense shame just came over him. Yeah. But really, the CGI is minimal. The only CGI I can really even think of is uh, the carves coming into port at the start of the film, and then like maybe the scene with the wolf. But that that might have been real, you know. There was a know. storm, and they kind of had to like put the storm in with CGI. And I'm really disappointed they didn't just wait for a storm. In <laughs> like I yeah, mean, like, I mean, you like can't wait until three o'clock that day for. You're a not going to put these celebrity actors through a real storm. What are you doing? Mm. <laughs> for shame, for shame, for. Uh, but shame. really, again, I do love this movie. I was so fucking psyched that you agreed to do this one. But yeah, it was mostly practical effects. Um, Fuck, I had a really good point. Let me go piss, and I'm going to think about my point that I was going to make, and then we can just dive into the plot, I guess. Guess who's back? Tell a friend. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Good song. Good song. It is. I saw... uh, We're not going to go on a tangent, but I did see that Fiddy and uh, him are beefing again. So that's fun. That means they just need to drum up some more album sales. Yeah. That's, that's all that means. That's all uh, that how means. How do you need to drum up more album sales when you've made as much money as those two? They're trying to be relevant again. Hmm. It's a little difficult. Uh, yeah. Sail into the sunset, man. Yeah, it gets a little pathetic after a while, in my opinion. If I, if I had made hundreds of millions of dollars, I would gladly sail into the sunset. Oh, you'd never see me again. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going <gonna laughs> to go be playing exotic gambling games like I'm fucking James Bond and like Monaco or whatever for the I'm rest gonna of I'm going to be hunting life. the most dangerous game with old-timey muskets. Mm, I mean, if you're going to do it, it's like you either go primitive with like a fucking per- bow prop. and axe like you're a Viking yeah, berserker. Yeah, that's true. Or, or you just like lean into the I'm rich as fuck and I'm hunting humans and do it with like, you know, a helicopter, fucking (laughs) sniper rifle. (laughs) Yeah, dude. Yeah, thermal scoped sniper weapons. (laughs) It's one or the other, right? You don't split the line and say like I'm just gonna use a musket. You know, no. You either either go like truly fucking badass and you hunt that motherfucker like a caveman. Or you just, it's like shooting fish in a barrel and you're just doing it because like you have no reason to live anymore. You're like hoping to get caught, you know, you're doing the job. (laughs) I love how if you, we say that we're not going to go on a tangent, like we definitely are about to go on a tangent. Yeah. That was your (laughs) fault. You, you brought the most dangerous game into it. You know, I couldn't resist. (laughs) There was no way we weren't going to talk about it for a couple seconds. So, going into the film, we don't need to get too deep into the plot. I think maybe there's some people who haven't even seen it yet. Which... Yeah, we don't want to... As always, we're going to spoil stuff. If you don't want to be too spoiled. But listening. there's no way we can spoil the visual spectacle that is this film. Like, I would say, you know, the plot is as old as 
fucking time. It's Hamlet. It's the legend of Amleth. You know, it's not like we can really spoil that at this point. It's the Lion King. I mean, come on. What makes the film awesome is the visual spectacle. It's kind of, you know, it's action. As my friend Matt said, who a friend of the show, um, actually guest host for one episode, um, Crimes of the Future. Check that one out. Plug in it. Uh, but as he said, it's a film that was meant to be watched in theaters. And I think it's, it's poor box office had to do with its release still being during the time of COVID. When like, you know, many people who love films probably didn't feel comfortable going to theaters or, you know, breathing that circulated air in with a bunch of other motherfuckers. Uh, but it is a film that is like deserves to be seen. That's how you get monkey pox, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot of things. I don't think breathing it's not it's not airborne yet. Um soon though, soon. Uh <laughs> in anywho, it's a film that deserves to be seen at least on a big fucking TV with like the lights turned off and like everybody taking it seriously. Like, don't watch this movie with some fucking friends who are gonna sit on their phones checking their stupid Instagram the whole time or gonna like I mean, I like to riff as much as the next person. This is not a film you riff through. It's like a film that I think you absorb because it is like a work of art. Um, it, it, it's just like so visually stunning. I mean, it's, you know, it's a more audience ex- accessible The Lighthouse, which I also think is visually stunning and just an absolute work of art. Uh, in this, though, we get lots of cool killing. So, you know. Lots of cool killing. A whole lot yeah. of cool killing. But yeah, the film takes place in... 895 we've got amleth played by that's Alexander before william Skarsgård. the conqueror by the way as what oh before, before william the conqueror i'm just trying to sound smart this episode. we got amleth played by alexander scar well at the beginning we get young amleth and it's the kind of the tale as old as time um he's kind of the heir to the throne his father who's the king gets betrayed by his brother right after coming back from like a recent conquest or whatever. Um, yeah, he's kind of like mortally wounded. And his brother, sensing that weakness, finishes him off. Maybe not mortally or gravely, but he is seriously wounded. Um, he. <laughs> I I also like. So, the Am- or not Amleth, uh, Arundel is played. Amleth's father is played by Ethan Hawke, who I just like. Ethan Hawke's one of my favorite genre guys, right? Like, that dude lives, breathes, and plays in, like, the sci-fi horror genres. He's done some other shit, like the, you know, fucking Before Midnight series or whatever, and that's great. People love that movie. Um, But, like, most of his works, and especially most of his works in recent years, he's leaned into the horror. Uh, And I just love it. I love it when, like, an actor who has legitimate acting chops, like, embraces a genre and, like, loves to play in it. Um, I mean, like, just naming a few Ethan Hawke. I mean, like, Gattaca, obviously, is, like, one of the most beautiful sci-fi films ever made. But, uh, I mean, he was in Daybreakers, which is, like, one of the few zombie movies that I think has got any merit to it. Um, and I, or not zombie, vampires. And I like vampires. I just feel like Twilight ruined it a little bit for me. Uh, he was in The Purge, the original The Purge, which, you know, has been played the fuck out, but good uh, low budget ish horror with like a high production value. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on, but I like, I like Ethan Hawke a great deal. Uh, so I was thrilled to see him in this. Almost unrecognizable under that like big beard and long hair. But so he, he comes back, you know, from his, like (laughs) his conquering and his wife at one point played by Nicole Kidman, the queen, um, like basically like makes a plea with him to like stop conquering and he's like i i'm gonna die on the battlefield and get to valhalla like i would <laughs> I, I particularly like this line i don't want to become a shameful gray beard <laughs> like li- nice. living to old age is something to be like horrifically ashamed of mm. Sh- shameful gray beard but yeah so the brother betrays him kills him then they start coming for the sun because... Well, ooh, before we talk about that, let's talk about the sweet, like, shaman ceremony. Oh, yeah, that... yeah, that's important. That's when they drink the henbane or whatever, and they're all tripping out and acting like wolves. 
So yeah, so like the dad brings him to like this subterranean little pit with Willem Dafoe's character, who's like the court jester, who makes some, you know, lewd but funny jokes and it pisses his fucking stick up the ass brother off. But like after, you know, the king's return, they go into the subterranean pit and they, they drink the hen's bane and have this like father son hallucinogenic moment with the shaman, uh, played by Willem Dafoe. It is super crazy and super super nuts and it just it felt right felt very <laughs> it felt right felt very proto-human you know dad why did we never have this moment yeah at, at one point though he like makes his son you know the young amleth touch the bad wound that he has across his stomach or whatever and he like sees this like flash of this like tree kind of like a family tree but it like goes from the roots up and it's corpses and then slightly less you know decomposed corpses to more recent looking people when you see the king arundel and then above him you know young amla sees his place in the tree of kings uh, which we will reference again before this podcast is done so i think that's pretty cool that touches like i don't know that i part like genealogy sweet. i like that part family sweet. heritage it's fucking cool must be nice to have a family but <laughs> it is um but uh you know fucking Willem Dafoe's character in this, like, as always, intense. Like, he, he's just got, like, an intense face, right? He he delivers intensity extremely well. Uh, but I really liked him as this, like, crazy Viking shaman slash trusted uh, advisor to the king. All right, so now we can get on with, you know, the betrayal. Yeah, so betrayal comes after the son because he's obviously the heir to the throne. The sun, the sun kind cuts of, a dude's nose off, which is fucking sweet. Fucking badass. And that guy comes back later, no nose man. Yeah, pretty noseless. fun. And then, like, we kind of get a fast forward to the future where Amleth is now a full grown adult, played by Alexander Skarsgård. And he, he is, escapes, I guess, like, to make it clear. Like, he isn't killed. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is out. his revenge story. So he's going to yeah. make it to the end. He flees the country, he escapes, and he. Comes links a, up becomes a viking berserker and there's like an awesome scene kind of at the beginning where he's on this boat and they're growing to war and then they like raid this village and this is like one of the most beautiful scenes of the whole movie it's like a four minute single shot which they had to like practice over and over again to get it right um and it's just so yeah they do so they, well, they do some more like shaman shit the fucking berserkers do their little mushroom fest that we talked about and then they raid it. And the scene starts with like a guardsman on top of a tower throwing a fucking long spear. And Amleth literally snags the spear out of the air and without like a moment's thought immediately chucks it back and skewers this motherfucker. And like, have you ever tried to throw like a spear? It is not easy. I have tried. It is not an easy task. And he, dude, he drops that fucking guy. Oh yeah, it's badass. Which I guess that is a direct nod to another Icelandic folktale called the Nyal's saga. So there you go. But so yeah, the single the single shot scene, we see like them like raid the wall, our fucking badass hero literally climbs the wall using his fucking axe to like stick it into the tree wall and climbs up, you know, beats off <laughs> not beats off. Beats <laughs> off. Uh, yeah, mm. he beats off some dude. He um <laughs> he like he deflects a blow from like somebody above him, which is like while he's climbing a wall, it's so difficult. Gets over and just like they just start laying waste. And this dude, the this guy's fucking Hensbane mushroom mixture has him like on superhero level. Like one, he's shredded. He's shredded like a Julian salad man. But two, dude, he dodges arrows. He fucking kills a bunch of people. Like I mean, he's he's like rolling with the force and power of the gods behind him. Pretty. Yeah, he's one of the chosen ones for sure. Pretty fucking sweet. I don't. Weird thing about Robert Eggers. Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. He wanted like most of these dudes to be naked. He's a big fan of male nudity. He does like it. <laughs> and he fought hard for their dicks to all be hanging out while they were doing this, while they were beating off other dudes. And Is that... <laughs> did, the, did the studio shut that one the down? The studio shut that one down. They said it would Fucking alienate typical. the audience. <laughs> so that's that's. I sad. mean, it, it certainly would be less viewable with your teenage daughter than it is in its current form. True. 
That's all I'm yeah. saying. I mean, you're, if you watch this with your teenage daughter, she will be checking Instagram the whole time. Let's just be clear about that. Uh, I mean, it also has Skarsgård, again, looking super shredded. Like, I think you're you're downplaying that's, the like, raw that's sexuality of that man in this movie. He's jacked as fuck. He's a giant Viking dude who, like, is basically unstoppable. That's true. He's pretty badass. Dude, people have touched themselves thinking about Amla. That's all I'm saying. You're too much information, Andrew. We I'm not saying I have. I'm just saying <laughs> people have. Almost definitely. There's a lot of people out there. That's true. There's a lot of yeah. people. They've touched themselves to almost anything you can imagine. The whole spectrum. <laughs> there are people who hook their faces up to tubes and that are connected to other people's farts. <laughs> they, it's like a, <laughs> like a bong gas mask, but it just siphons the fart straight into their face. It's endless what people touch themselves to, Andrew. That's I've how you seen get it. Pink eye, bro. I've seen that it on how, the internet. <laughs> that is a guaranteed way to get pink eye. That's true. Yep. Anyway, moving forward. Not kink shaming, but like conjunctivitis is terrible. That's yeah, that's a real thing. Yeah, that is a real thing. <laughs> that's why I use the medical word for it. Um But yeah, so during this scene when they raid the Slavic village, this is when we get the Cirrus. Is that how you say that? She's basically uh, a witch. Correct. I think that's right. I, I'd always just heard seer, but like, I guess like She's the whole seer-esque. using the male version universally is like, you know, out of vogue at this point. So I didn't know seer had was a gendered term, but apparently I think it is. It, I think it, it is. Okay. Fair. Fair. Yeah. So the seer s. This is called. She's a witch. All right. Like we don't want to say the witch because he did a movie called the witch, but like she's a she witch. is a witch. She's a witch. Played she's by Bjork. Witch. Played excellently by Bjork. I love the costume design here, man. Like the three puka shells or whatever. Yeah, like the three crazy, eyes, like, basically. Yeah. It's pretty cool. and It's pretty fucking sweet. I'm a big fan of Bjork. I'm not like that familiar with her work or music, but I just know that she's like kind of a true artist, you know? I respect it. So the seeress slash witch played by Bjork, like... She tells him about his fate. She adds some extra details, but she's mostly reminding him of the shamanistic experience he had as a child because he had some of his fate outlined at that point, or outlined at that point, um, in that he, you know, was going to have to avenge his father eventually. So she, she she reminds him like, "Hey, this Viking berserker thing is cool and all, but like, you have shit you have to do, you know, to fulfill your destiny." Sets him back right on the right track again. So yeah, he he intentionally brands himself as a slave and then fucking sneaks onto a slaver's vessel, like swimming up to it and climbing on board without any of these people noticing. Just total fucking predator of a human being. He could have just slaughtered him all if he wanted to. But that's not his goal. He wants to end up in a certain kingdom. Uh, yeah. And he, he enslaves himself. Because he finds out these slaves are go- they're going to Fjolnor's little kingdom. And I guess he is kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, but Fjolnor has kind of been dethroned. There's a new king. Fjolnor is almost like living in exile now. He is. He has fled to Iceland, basically, um, after he himself was dethroned. Which is what happens, man. You fucking betray your brother. <laughs> Nobody's going to want to serve you. You're going to get thrown. It's bad karma. Bad karma. It is bad karma. But yeah, it's around this time that um, Amleth also meets Olga, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, who's kind of like his girlfriend. She essentially like... She becomes his lady. She's his lady. So... I mean, she's... They're both... You know, she's a little hesitant at first. She's, um, She's of Slavic origins in this film, and she's got... Super blonde hair, super long blonde hair, total like vision of a Valkyrie. Uh, and she also is like some kind of witch doing earth magic and shit. A lot of witches in this. A lot of witches. But yeah, so they kind of get sold into slavery. He kind of does come face to face with Fjolnor, who has now taken his mother to be his bride. And they've had so- children together. They're about to, like, slaughter the whole group of slaves. Shulner has decided they're not worthy. And he, like, just total fucking alpha move. They're all chained together. And he just grabs a chain and slings the whole line of men to the ground. 
to like demonstrate his physical strength and it saves him you know he is not slaughtered because of it he is kept as a slave it's pretty badass pretty badass so this whole time like he's kind of you know he's a servant to the man or a slave slash servant to the man who he hates and wants to kill so he's kind of waiting for his moment he kind of encounters this guy who what was that guy called the he witch he encounters this he witch who is like in this cave or whatever and we kind of come to find out he has Willem Dafoe's head and he like cuts little pieces off Willem Dafoe's head and like throws it in the fire and like magic happens so yeah he is he is like I mean I'm not gonna say shrunken headed because like the head is not shrunk but like similar he has this like weird preserved decapitated head of Willem Dafoe's character um, and he says that Shulnir basically cut out his eyes and tongue after they slayed Arendelle um, because, you know, he was like, he was boys with the king and he was a shaman. So like, the you know, got to protect your neck. You got to fucking kill that guy. Yep. So they, uh, a bad end came to the shaman, but this he witch has kept him as a friend by uh, preserving his head. And he's got like crazy looking like glassy white eyes and yellowed fucking skull teeth and yeah he cuts hair off and throws it in and if you listen willem defoe's voice speaks the lines at that point so it's like they're channeling the spirit of willem defoe's character uh when they give him the instructions to like basically find as every good hero story should have a fucking magic sword good old magic sword from a drogger yes so drogger um Drawer is like an Icelandic zombie, basically. Pretty badass. Yeah, living dead. And this Um, magical sword is at the gates of hell, which I guess is like this giant volcano. Correct. Well, that's like where the final fight scene is or whatever. Uh, Hell, spelled H-E-L. And it's in this mound, and he goes in there and he has to fight the undead mound dweller, which is the Draugr. Or is the Draugr the sword? I, the Draugr is the mound dweller, right? Correct. He's this, like, super giant fucking king zombie that he has to fight. And the zombie, like, is on. Oh, dude, our boy Omelette, who's just, like, a certified killing machine, is kind of getting fucked up by the Draugr. He's getting smacked dude, that around. That thing looked like it was, like, eight feet tall. And super powerful. It literally cut his sword in half. And, like, Amleth just, like, looks at the sword like, what the fuck? You know, this thing just cleaved it in half. Um, but he realizes that the Draugr can't walk into this, like, one little circle of moonlight peering into the cavern he's in. Uh, and he uses that to his advantage. Pretty badass. By, you know, smacking the zombie around until it hits the light. And then he gets behind it and fucking axes its spine, which is kind of think that's the sweet spot of this movie like it's so historically authentic but there is that just enough element of fantasy that like makes it fun you know exactly it's, it's a perfect balance in my opinion um so once he defeats the zombie however all of a sudden he like flashes back and he's just standing in front of like the mountain dweller's corpse holding the sword and it's like he he beat him in this like mental astral plane so now he can take the sword but with the caveat that the sword will not unsheath itself until it's time for him to fulfill his destiny. So, like, we'll see this dude fight with his sword later, but he can't take it out of the sheath. He's literally just bashing people with the sheath on. Pretty fun. Until he gets to the point to fulfill his destiny. Pretty so, fun. But he gets the sword and he, like, hides it in the fucking roof of his little hobbit hole um, that he is residing in or whatever. Uh some part of me he, wants to live in a hobbit hole, but at, at the same time, I know it's probably just damp in there. So he and Olga, who is the Slavic woman played by uh, Anya, um, like they start getting hot and heavy. You can tell that she's feeling him. And like, who wouldn't again? Beefcake, total beefcake. Uh, but it's like one of my other favorite scenes of this. He gets recruited by Sholmir's son um, to play uh Natlicker, which is stickball like this... it's just stickball it's yeah it's like <laughs> stickball it kind of makes me think of like a very primitive you know like 
Viking version of golf or whatever. Or like lacrosse or something. Scottish. Um, they all kind of blur together. It's like golf northern. mixed with rugby. <laughs> yeah, it's like golf mixed with rugby mixed with like a fucking prison riot. Uh, it It is an extremely violent blood sport. They have, you know, like field hockey sticks basically. And they're trying to smack a ball against a bigger stick in the ground. But like it is it's clear from what we watch that it is uh, totally cool to like bash your opponent's brains in or whatever pretty fun and then he basically saves his uncle's youngest son who runs out onto the field like an idiot and like this dude i think it's um i think it's the guy who plays the mountain in game it of is the guy who plays the mountain half poor julius bjornsson who is yeah, just a giant human being have you ever seen a picture of his girlfriend no is she tiny or big dude she's like four foot eleven and she's like i mean this guy is literally like three three four of her or something like that he's just like the biggest human to ever walk the earth i'd call it an odd couple it's like twins from uh <laughs> with danny vito and arnold schwarzenegger, and arnold schwarzenegger. <laughs> yeah uh but so this like this ultra big you know nat liquor fucking player has just like laid waste to all the rest of the team but of course, our boy Amleth is like riding that peak god empowered strength. And right before this giant lunk of a man <laughs> tees off a stone ball into this child's brain, which is like ex- what he is about to do, right? Like he is ready to just drive this thing through the kid's head to the stick. Uh, Amleth, in one of the most badass moments of all of his fight scenes, basically like tackles the dude and just. Beats his fucking face in with his forehead. Just headbutts the guy to death. Which is, I mean... It's a cool kill. It's a very cool kill. <laughs> That's a cool kill. <laughs> but, you know, covered in blood. Uh, but anyways, his his loyalty and bravery, which of course he's not very loyal, but his perceived loyalty and bravery uh, earns him like the rank of slave supervisor. And he gets to like pick a woman. So he picks Anya. Uh, or Olga, I should say. And thus, they get closer to being able to execute their big plan of vengeance against their captors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And kind of just moving right along here. Eventually, he kind of confronts his mother and says, like, I'm your son. Like, what happened that day? Like, I know you were taken into slavery. Like, let's, like, revolt against this motherfucker. She informs him that she had originally been taken into slavery by his father and she was raped and that's how Amleth was conceived and that really she wanted Amleth and his father dead and she was kind of in on the plot the whole time. If anything, she is like the the conspirator, conspirator who convinced Fjolnir to like betray his brother. It's pretty wild. Which is terrible news for a dude who just came here to like try and save his mother from who he thought was her captors. Uh, to add to it, she tries to seduce him. Yeah, that's don't they like make out or something? That part's. I, I mean, they nice. definitely lock lips for a second. Like, how much of that is you know him making out with her versus her fucking shooting her shot? I don't know. I mean, you've already broken every other taboo. I say just go for it. I mean, I feel like, <laughs> you know, Greek moth- mythology would disagree with me, but uh, mom, blood, son fucking is like pretty frowned upon, right? That's how you end up with like a fucking Ed Gein or whatever. <laughs> That's how you end, with, end up with like a blood dynasty. <laughs> That's how you end up with like Habsburg disease where you have a fucking deformed jaw and like can't eat your food or talk right. Any, anyways, <laughs> but yeah, Which, Habsburg disease that is a royalty disease, uh, mostly afflicting you know the Germanic people, so Germanic royalty, anyways. So, Omleth gets a little like, upset by all this and kills his half brother Thorir and steals his heart, which is kind of badass. His half brother and cousin, I guess. Yeah, and, and Olga, not to like downplay her character, she does some like cool fucking earth magic and makes all the dogs in the camp turn on the people, which is pretty badass. 
Yeah, she's a badass character, and I guess she like feeds everybody fly agaric mushroom, which I makes them all fucking crazy. Yeah, that's pretty fun. I want to say I also that's the Mario going back mushroom. to when he first got the sword. He's almost captured. That's actually when he realizes he can't take the sword out because he tries to unsheath it because he can hear Fisholmir and his men around the corner, but it won't come all the way out. And there's like a dog fucking growling at him, and they're about to come around the corner. And he does his best fucking Viking dog growl, which oh, yeah. I appreciate because I fucking bark and, do- and like growl at dogs. You know, that's like how I assert dominance you over dogs to. who are misbehaving. You have to. And yeah, they, they do. They respond, man. You get let out a deep fucking bark. They all stop what they're doing. They're like, whoa, Alpha has spoken. Uh, but he, he does like a perfect like fucking growl back. And like, it's so convincing that like Fajolnir and his men are just like, ah, oh, it's just a wild dog or whatever they say. And they're, you know. Old Norse, translated to English. One badass part that probably happened before this, but it's one of the coolest parts of the movie. Um, Amleth just like slays all these people like in the night, and then in the morning he has arranged them as like a display where he had turned these naked bodies into a horse. <laughs> and I also think it's interesting at that point that uh, the dude who had his nose cut off by Amleth when he was a child during like the uh, the overthrowing of King Arn Arvindil, uh is he says he think they and this like inspires belief amongst the camp that it's the Christian slaves who are doing it. And he says they worship a corpse nailed to a tree, um, which is kind of true. So, you know, that was that was very strange, perhaps, to uh, the Norsemen at that point. But, yeah, he, he definitely tacks up some body parts like a total fucking serial killer in the shape of a horse. Yeah, that's pretty extreme. It is. But, yeah, they ultimately catch him and um, they tie him up. Well, he, he bargains. He says he has his, you know... Uh, Fjolnir's son's heart and he's like you let Olga go and you can have me and then they capture him and he's like this is he basically says this is just a fucking wild dog's heart and your son's heart is not in this bag this part's kind of badass because while he's tied up he's kind of confronting the uncle everyone knows who everyone is now the cat's out of the bag and he's kind of interrogating like where's my son's heart at this point, Omelette says, even if you tried to kill me, your sword wouldn't bite because it's not my time, really. Like, my fate is to die in this epic battle. It's all been laid out before him by the Seeress, which, you know. Yeah, by the fates, basically. Kind of badass. And, yeah, so the, the uncle goes off to, like, you know, bury his, or do the funeral right for his son. And I love this scene. Um, some ri- It's like the only like real display of Odin. But basically he's like strung up in this barn and a bunch of ravens come and they pick at the ropes and his ropes fall and he breaks free. And like the camera pans back to like him on the ground and you can just like see Odin standing behind him. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, Odin is very partial to ravens. He had two ravens that were his companions and it's like a, a common symbol or, you know, association with odin is ravens that and plucking your eye out what odin is odin like analogous to like zeus in greek mythology i mean it's not like a one-to-one comparison but like if you had to like draw a comparison that's pretty close he's the all father you know like gotcha yeah he's the big he's the big badass motherfucker at the top of the pyramid he's thor's father okay so yeah Got it. But but anyways, we see Odin, which like fucking just got my dick so hard. Uh, I was so fucking. It's a weird thing Odin. to get a boner at, but I'm not so gonna kink the, shame. We get the funeral rite of the prince, um, which is fucking crazy. You know they like do like the whole Viking funeral pyre, but uh, his woman or like his concubine, I don't know what her you know rank and file was, but the woman that you know is like his his lady fucking kills herself or rather has like you know herself killed as part of this like ritual to send the prince off reminds me a lot of like you know pharaohs or whatever having their servants slayed with them that's dedication and then the youngest son of Sholnir uh cuts a horse's head off Mm. which would be pretty hard to do with the sword is all i'm saying It'd be extremely difficult. Especially for like an 11-year-old kid. 
he's like just as likely to break his wrists trying to do that as he is to succeed. I imagine he would have had to. Does it show that? I don't remember that part. I would imagine um, he would have I, been sawing at that for a while. Mm-hmm. Sawing, hacking. You know, swords aren't really a saw tool, but yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we don't see the horse's head come off, but we see them like steady the horse and him draw the blade back or whatever. I gotcha. Pretty badass. Well, he ends up fucking this little kid up because that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that kid who's his, also his cousin and half brother. You know, kind of like getting near the big climax. This kid, like, sees that he's escaped, jumps on him, and just starts stabbing him with his little knife over and over You're again. You're right. Yes. So, but first, Olga comes back and rescues him. They're, like, fleeing the fucking country or whatever. He, like, kisses her stomach or whatever. Because she, like, you know, for whatever reason, he kisses her stomach, womb, whatever. She's... And he, he has a vision of the king tree again. But this time, he sees two children above him a boy and a girl and the girl is like wearing like a crown and scepter and the serious mentions that he's going to be like intertwined with a maiden king so it's like Mm. he sees here that like his offspring is going to rule interesting like maybe it's not his lot in life to rule it was his lot in life to like reclaim the throne basically but he, he basically tells olga he's like you know, I was told I'm going to have to choose between, like, r- hatred and vengeance upon my enemies and, like, care for my kin. I choose both because, like, as long as Fajolnir is alive, he will hunt us. So I'm going to go back and, like, Fair. finish the fucking Fair. job. Like, it is my job to do this. I think that's just, like, what you have to tell your wife, though. Because earlier again, on in the movie, he's like, I will always choose vengeance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he found a way to spin it. He's so like, he listen, to... I only know revenge. I don't know yeah. love. <laughs> He still gets to go to fucking Valhalla and die in battle, but this way he gets to tell himself he's a good dad. It's uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> it's just a couple ticks better than like going out for a pack of fucking cigarettes and never coming back. But uh, correct. <laughs> she, we get to see her do like one like last fucking witch thing. She like does this like you know earth magic spell for fucking wind, and the wind picks up, which is cool. We get to see her be all spooky one more time. Um, That's fun. I like him a little back. bitchy. He goes back and just like lays waste to the camp. He fuck he, he dude he drives his sword into like the gaping axe wound that is that dude's former nose, and that's how he kills him. He just slides it into his face. Fucking intense. That's awesome. Uh, she comes upon his mother, you know, slays her. Nicole Kidman eats it, uh, and that's when the little the little dude pops out of the fucking shadows. And out of everyone, this guy has, like, had to fight this whole movie. This, like, eight-year-old or whatever does by far the most damage to this guy. Oh, yeah. He almost (laughs) takes him out. He stabs him, like, ten times. Yeah. Like, he is, like, blood-soaked in that shoulder for the rest of the film. But, yeah, he gets him good, man. That would be horrible damage to your your fucking shoulder. Fair enough. I mean, he's just doing... That little kid's just doing what he wishes he had done at the beginning of the movie. (laughs) Indeed, indeed. But, and he, he kills the kid, and you can see he actually kind of, like, feels a little bit remorseful for that. Like, he slings the kid off, and in one motion, like, does the whole fucking sword slashy thing. Yeah. And, like, lay, lays waste to this 10-year-old. Arguably, his only moment of weakness was when he felt slightly regretful about that kill. He does. <laughs> but then he looks up, and, of course, fucking Fjolnir is standing there. So, like, I mean, this is, like, kind of revenge enough, right? Like, you've destroyed this dude's entire bloodline. You've destroyed his kingdom. You, like, single-handedly have basically killed all of his men. It's just you and him left. You and your father's betrayer slash uncle. Yep. So now we get the final fight. Oh, yeah. We got to have the... At the gates of hell. (laughs) This is an awesome scene. Also, just want to throw out there, again, Robert Eggers wanted this fight to be totally nude <laughs> of course he did <laughs> and apparently they have cgi genitals in this scene which i didn't notice that i wasn't did they make them bigger or smaller <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> they made them swing a little bit bigger because they're they, viking yeah, berserkers they, <laughs> they added some fucking jizzle jiggle fiz- jizzle <laughs> jiggle physics <laughs> to the fucking bulges in both these dudes loincloths <laughs> Because they are in loincloths. The rest of this, they're like 
you know, at least somewhat clothed, maybe some shirtlessness going on. And this scene, these two dudes are like fighting at the mouth of a volcano, basically lava fucking everywhere. And all they're wearing is like the Viking equivalent of a G string. Pretty much. Yep. Pretty fun. But yeah, they, uh, and of course, you know, this is, I knew this was going to happen and I don't even, I've never even read Hamlet. I didn't know the legend, but you know, they're both going to (laughs) die. They are. You know, he can't live. The prophecy is that he will die in battle. And you know, he's not going to let that other guy live. Back to like him being honorable, though, like at the gates of hell before like the final fight scene when he's like approaching, he like sees like the corpse of the young, his, (laughs) his half brother, cousin, his brother and his mom. And he like stops and says a prayer for both of them, even though they're like his sworn enemies. That's nice. It is nice. It is like it shows like some value of kinship. You know, I like that. I get that. Um, When I annihilate my whole family, I'll remember to stop and say a little prayer. That'll make it all better. Um, You know, your good intentions. Crisp and Law style. But yeah, they have the big final fight, which is sweet. You know, I kind of obviously I like this movie more than it, but it reminds me of the uh, the Obi Wan fucking Anakin fight scene in Star Wars Episode Three. Yes, it was very much like that. I would, and it also I saw a meme where it was just. Image to image, it was the exact same as the final scene of The Lion King. Oh, shit. Okay, well, that's fair. Um, I didn't see that. should have shared that, man. I would have loved to have seen that. Oh, it's going to uh, be shared. Don't worry. But but they have a sweet fight scene. I mean, obviously, his shoulder's fucked up. He's not at full strength. So the old the old king, Fajolnir, gives him a little bit of a run for his money. And he's actually pretty buff, too. You know, he's looking pretty... He's looking like a Viking. Oh, uh, yeah. But our, our dude gets cut up. He's feeling weak. His arm's all slashed to hell. His, like, sword arm. And he just, like, he digs deep, man. Picks it up and two hands the swords. And, like, the... I love the death for both of them, to go ahead and say it. But, like, he decapitates Fajolnir. And, like, you just kind of, like, see their silhouettes. And Fajolnir's sword is, like, pointed at him. And then when Fajolnir's body crumples, like, the sword remains, like, run through his side, basically. Yep. And he dies, you know, knowing that he has fulfilled his fate. He is ensured that his offspring shall reach monarchyhood. Uh, and he gets to go to Valhalla, because that is that is a Valhalla-worthy What death, is Valhalla? Movie. Is that like heaven in there? Do you not know anything about Norse mythology? No, I don't know anything. I told you this. <laughs> you did, you did. Explain. You were <laughs> yeah, yeah. Valhalla is like I'm not Norse some pagan. Heaven, what do you think? But like, as, as a condition, as like opposed to like not adultering or lying or like wearing polyester or whatever, like you have to die a warrior's death to make uh, it to Valhalla. Interesting. In a thong. You're taken there. You're taken there by the Valkyries, fucking like you know, pretty badass. And that's the final scene. He's taken there by a Valkyrie. It is. And a and Valkyrie is she an angel so fierce. for the She's uninitiated. So fierce looking. A Valkyrie is basically an angel. It's like an angel, and that I think you know this film does a lot to uh, <laughs> show you how there was a merging of belief systems and traditions and cultures between you know, uh, Christianity and like the Norse religions, obviously, you know, Christmas trees, what do you know? The fucking Yule log, all that shit comes from the North. Um, it's, it's a whole thing. It's like, you know, anyways, fair enough. That's the Northmen folks. That's it. Oh my gosh. We've been talking for so long. Loved this movie looking. F- I hope he does Nosferatu next. Like he's the perfect director to tackle that. As a remake. Yeah, probably the only one. Probably the only one I can think of. Oh, man. Yeah. I don't know. This movie was just so fucking sweet. It just speaks to me. And, you know, I'm sure somebody somewhere doesn't like it, but they're wrong. And I'll I'll tell that to their face. I'll, I'll fucking die on this hill. This movie is fucking awesome. I will fight them to the death, nude, on a volcano. The volcano Hecla. Actually, we didn't say that earlier, but I had it in my notes. There you go. There you go. Well, that's it, folks. We were we're going at it for a while. I think, um, you know, 
Go to the Facebook page, the Instagram, the Patreon. Like, subscribe, leave a comment. Do all the things. Got the Tell YouTube going. Make us fan art. Do you have a boomer uncle who doesn't know what a podcast is? Share the YouTube. They'll probably like us. He'll love us. It might help you get like a good Christmas present this year or whatever. <laughs> Finally earn your uncle's love. <laughs> Unlikely. Yeah, he's never going to love he's you. He's never going to um, love you. No. <laughs> Unless you're a grill or a fucking six pack of Bud Heavy, he's never <laughs> going to love you. <laughs> <laughs> oh god that was a fun one i third i hadn't seen this movie before this week and uh, oh we had brutal technical difficulties on this episode too it's okay they don't they don't care they don't but i just want them to know that we're working we're working <laughs> we're working because you know, working. i'm working over time also know. shout out to our boy troy troy have hey troy how's it going buddy hey friend super fan it's been a while we haven't we haven't we it's been at least a few episodes since we we uh we gave a shout out to troy so never we are doing it again never forget troy who lifted us up in our darkest hour and made us continue with this podcast right on guys well thanks for listening as always till till next time flickers for life keep on flicking also hey this is episode 20 of season three big time Fucking big time. We did it. We did. That's five months straight. I don't think we missed a single week in five we months. We haven't. That's, we haven't since huge. you like chewed me out for being a bad co <laughs> co creator. I don't want to let Troy we, down, okay? I'm not Yeah. You're right. We can't do that. All right, folks. Thank again we do we said all right folks like four times. Thank you so much Thank for listening. You guys. Seriously. Peace. Bye.